It is easy to understand that a poor ghost, condemned to rapping on tables for profit of a very sort of social adventurer, must lose all heart for either the lighter or more serious business of its existence. The modern spirit is, in truth, in bonds. Its original occupation is gone, to be replaced by such indignified exercises as beating tambourines or tweaking noses at a dark seance. Today's episode is brought to you by HelloFresh Canada. If you feel like you're stuck in a dinner rut, HelloFresh will bring you fresh, pre-measured ingredients with mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Skip all the trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. You can now enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in 30 minutes or less. With over 25 recipes to choose from each week, there's something for everyone to enjoy. That means veggie skewers and couscous for me and... Mediterranean chicken for Frank and Tito. Go to the link in the show notes to get $80 off, including free shipping on HelloFresh, the number one meal kit. <coughs> Welcome back to the History Obscura podcast. Once upon a time, on Tuesday, the 15th of January, 1901, the Sunderland Daily Echo and Shipping Gazette published the following story. Bessie Brown of Cameron, Oklahoma, is married to a ghost. Furthermore, she and her spectral husband are living together in a five-roomed cottage. The wedding took place one week ago, and the bride and groom moved at once into their new house, which Miss Brown had furnished with her own money. They are as happy as any young married couple could be, and persons who pass the house can hear them talking and laughing just as if they were both in human form. This is the strangest romance ever known. Bessie Brown, of wealthy parents, high social standing, and possessed of many natural charms that make her one of the most beautiful girls in Oklahoma, married the ghost of the man she loved. She is not demented. Her mind has been tested. Her brain has been examined by specialists, and her actions have been watched carefully. But no trace of insanity can be discovered. Therefore, the parents agree that she must be wedded to an apparition, something which she imagines she can see and know, but which no other human being can recognize. This is what her father says about his daughter's queer actions. Bessie had been brooding continually over the death of John Allen, to whom she was engaged to be married when he was killed. We tried to console her in her grief, but she wanted us to leave her alone. We feared she would lose her mind if she did not stop grieving so intensely. I had a doctor visit her several times, and he said her mind was all right, but that she was failing in health on account of constant worry. That was a year ago. About six weeks ago, Bessie brightened up so much that we feared she was under the influence of some drug. Then one day, she made the statement that she had seen the ghost of Mr. Allen, and that hereafter she would not be sorrowful any more for she was going to marry the ghost. She said she had given her promise to her sweetheart that if ever he died, that she would marry his ghost. And so now that his spirit has arrived and appeared to her, she must keep her promise. Mrs. Brown and I feared the poor girl had lost her mind surely by this time, so we sent to Dallas for a specialist to make another examination of her brain. He pronounced her mental condition perfectly normal, and said that she was not under the influence of any drug. He said her case was a strange one, and that she must surely see the ghost she talked so much about. 
I asked her to introduce me to the ghost, and she said I could not see it, but that it was with her always. She talked reasonably about it. She seemed to know that we thought she was insane because of her declarations, but insisted that she was actually going to marry the specter. She called upon our minister and asked him to perform the ceremony. He tried to persuade her that it was sinful that she should marry a mere apparition, but she insisted. The minister went with Bessie last week into the graveyard where her lover was buried. At midnight, the ceremony was performed, which united her to the ghost of the man whom she had promised to marry two years ago, but who was killed in a railroad wreck just a few weeks previous to the wedding. I believe after close study of the girl's actions that she truly thinks she is wedded to the ghost, and that the apparition appears to her as naturally as if the spirit were still in the body. We are trying to do everything we can to make her forget her ghost, but it seems as if we are going to fail. Before the graveyard wedding, Miss Brown rented a cottage and furnished it for two. She is now living in it with her ghost husband. She can be seen sitting in the back porch, conversing with an invisible companion, and often walks along the street talking aloud to some person whom no one can see. The town people are much excited over the matter. They all know Miss Brown to be a Christian young woman, and one who would not deceive anyone for the world. Most of them actually believe she is married to the ghost of her dead lover. Now, here's another one from September of 1881 that comes from The Police Illustrated News. The paper reported the facts of the case of a nocturnal visitant. Mm -hmm. He was quietly perusing his way along a lonely road near the village of Garstang, absorbed in his occupation of letter carrier, and a ghost stopped his way and warned him with many mysterious signs not to continue in his present courses. The terrified postman immediately acted upon the ghostly injunction to the extent that he at once turned tail and fled. He carried away with him a very clear notion of the ghost's principal characteristics. These would seem to be abnormal stature, a horrid pallor of hue, and a variety of terror-striking gestures. His description of the Garstang ghost is borne out by the testimony of another impeachable witness. A young woman of the district has also had a dreadful look at the specter. She happened also to be out in the haunted lane when evening had in her sober livery all things clad. As she walked along, perhaps in maiden mediation, not altogether fancy free, her affrighted eyes beheld the ghost. There it was of fearsome height, clothed in white, and performing portentous movements with its arms, so she afterwards declared. This witness testimony is invalidated to a trifling extent by her confession that directly she saw the awful sight, she threw her apron over her head and ran home. Having got there safely, she instantly went to bed where she has since remained in proof of the truth of her story. Another illustrated police news story from August of 1895 says, An extraordinary scene was witnessed during the early hours of Wednesday, the 21st of this month, in the churchyard of the parish church of St. John at Hackney, when fully 1,000 men and women turned out from their houses in the neighborhood to hunt for a supposed ghost. For some time, people passing through the churchyard late at night might have been startled by the appearance of a ghost. Women have fainted with fright, and the local newspapers have published accounts of the strange affair. Between 10 and 11 o'clock on Tuesday night, a mixed crowd began to assemble at the rear of the church, where the ghost was supposed to be, and where, in the usual way, scarcely anyone passes after 11 o'clock. 
a long wait until midnight, and then, as no ghost appeared, the crowd went in search of it. Armed with lanterns and candles and carrying sticks and stones, the crowd climbed the railings from the pathways and took possession of the burial ground. Graves and tombstones were clambered over, and recently restored mounds were trampled down. A portion of the crowd looked upon the whole affair as a joke, and consequently, every few minutes the cry was raised of, There it goes! And immediately the whole crowd rushed in the direction indicated. Others amused themselves by making the night hideous with imitations of unearthly cries, and although the police were requisitioned to clear the place, it was not until the verge of daylight that the last few stragglers went away. The damage to the graves was very great, and efforts will be made to prevent any further demonstration. Many complaints were made by those present of having their pockets picked. The tomb from which the ghost is supposed to appear is a grave at the back of the church, the stone representing three boys playing at cards on a table. The origin of this device is explained as follows. Several years ago, three boys were playing cards for money, when one of them, who was losing very heavily, exclaimed, May God strike me dead if I do not win this game. When he rose to leave the table, he dropped down dead, and his ghost, it is supposed, to haunt the spot. A force of about 40 constables were on the scene on Wednesday night, and had much difficulty in controlling the mob, which indulged freely in horseplay. Thank you for listening. Please check out our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash history obscura, or check out the show links to see how to buy us a nice cup of tea. Either way, your support is very much needed and appreciated. Good night. Thank you.